Hello. I think we're on the air now. Can um, can everyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Is Megan there? She is. Okay. Okay, it is 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I think we will we will get started. We have a very exciting topic today. Um, so let me get through some of the introductions. Um, my name is Caroline Amio. I'm a senior project engineer at the city of um, Waterloo, and I'm going to be our the moderator for today. I've known Chris for a long time. I was um, involved with CAT at the University of Waterloo for many years, and now I've, I've, um, I'm involved with QIC as well with the Education and Workshop Committee, so I'm excited about this webinar. Um, this is the 11th um, webinar that QIC has posted, um, and today we are going to speak about using AI and other advanced analytics to drive water and sewer assessment and long-term capital planning programs. And that will be presented by Chris Macy. Um, a little bit about QIC before we move on to Chris. Um, it was organized by the this this as I, I said in the first um, in the beginning. This was event was organized by the Canadian Underground Infrastructure Innovation Center. Um, the Education and Workshop Committee, which I am a part of, um, at the University of Alberta, and along with Benjamin Media. The QIC Academy offers, um, in addition to the webinar series, classes, courses, and other events to help further underground infrastructure education opportunities across Canada. Um, this webinar series that we've started um, was the very first thing the group started when we started getting things rolling um, just over a year ago. Um, and the idea is that this short series, this short one hour series will cover a variety of pressing topics related to the underground infrastructure sector um, with speakers, including industry leaders, professionals who will provide, um, these are free educational webinars to the public followed by a question and answer period. Um, they're every third Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and there's for a full schedule of events, you can go to the academy.qic.ca. Um, one other event I just want to speak to before we get going is um, the QIC 2023 Safety Academy, which is November 29th and 30th. Um, this is a, a must-attend event for owners, consultants, managers, contractors, suppliers, and safety professionals working in road building, development, and underground construction. The event, um, as I said, it takes place over two days, November 29th and 30th in Edmonton, um, Alberta. The Safety Academy experts will present a two-day course that is designed to equip attendees with knowledge related to underground construction, safety, regulations, and challenges and innovation. Um, registration includes full access to presentations, breakfast, lunch, coffee breaks, and networking reception. Um, there will be CEUs by request if you need them. Um, more details are on the Cube Academy website. Um, we are also planning to do something similar, another safety academy in the spring in Ontario. The details for that aren't yet planned yet. And we're also hoping um, this topic, um, the use of AI, is, is a very big one. We could almost have a whole day on it. So Chris has been kind enough to smush it in to this half-hour webinar. But... Um, the idea is that we hope to present more of this material at the uh, Safety Academy in September, or, or sorry, in the spring. Um, Chris, I'm just going to ask you quick, are, are you presenting anything in November in a couple weeks on this? Uh, no, not to okay, my knowledge. I okay, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. No, I, I didn't think so. So I, I think that the plan was to have this topic presented in the spring. So this is a bit of a, a, a precursor, and we're really just the tip of the iceberg, I, I think, with this topic as it's new and it's it's evolving and um, it's a really exciting one. So I just wanted to foreshadow that a little bit. Um, I'm not on the planning um, committee for the Safety Academy in November that's coming up, so I, I wasn't entirely clear on the, on the agenda that's planned for that, but there's lots of good topics um, 
for that one as well. And you, you should definitely check it out. Um, and just a few other events. The last uh, webinar series uh, for this year will be on December 14th, and it's the City of Edmonton's Blanchford District Energy System it will be presented by Ruben Arlanio um, for Associated Engineering, speaking a little bit about that. So that looks like a great topic as well. Again, free, so take a look at that. It's on the website. Um, and I've already spoken about the Safety Academy. There's also the 2024 Pipeline Rehabilitation Academy that we've started planning. And that um, last year it was in Ontario. And this year we're bringing it, uh, or for 2024, we're going to bring it out west. And that's already been scheduled for March 13th and 14th in Richmond, BC this year. So go to the website um, and check that out. It was, um, it was well received in Ontario last year. And we hope to continue doing the swap in the two locations and continue to update the content with the information that's valuable um, to the underground industry. And uh, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor of the 2023 webinar series, and that's MPipe. Thank you for supporting underground infrastructure, education, innovation. Um, it's much appreciated. And um, finally, I'm done with my, my preamble. I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to Chris and I'm gonna let Chris introduce himself um, for those that don't know him. Um, uh, Chris is awesome, and I'm going to let him go from there. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, uh, probably ask yourself why an old guy is talking about artificial intelligence. And uh, But we've been working with condition assessment and advanced analytics for a long time. And uh, I have the, the fortunate of not only being working in the business for a long time in terms of analytic processes, but uh, I sit on the, the, the AI advanced uh, committee for NASCO, where we do a lot of work on trying to provide guidelines and map the industry moving forward on sewer condition assessment. And I'm fortunate with uh, Celine Heyer uh, to be sitting on the AYM 77 for the second edition. And, uh, and AI advanced analytics plays a really, really big role in the water main world of desktop studies and advancing things. So with that, uh, I've been around for a while and uh, still having fun so hopefully can can talk today about some of the things and scratch the surface of, of advanced analytics and both on the water side and the sewer side uh, there's been an immense amount of work in the last few years uh, I would say in the last 10 years and, and probably longer uh, we think it's brand new and we get kind of enamored by what is AI and uh, and AI, as I'll talk about a little more in a moment, has been around for a long time, and it means many different things. Uh, I, I, if you've heard me talk before, I, I resent the word artificial intelligence. It's real intelligence. It's, in essence, advanced analytics are a really, really critical area for us to move forward in both the world of water and sewer. In the water side, uh, predictive analytics, program optimization, those type of things, in the sewer side, uh, I think the most familiar thing we have is automated defect recognition where we, we, we have a radical change to industry but uh, uh, things that we can apply in condition assessment go way beyond that and that's really really critical so it's intelligent use of data as i said it's not new it's been around for a long time uh, uh, it's it's maximizing the amount we can do with data in that context so in the in the what the future has in store for us is really really critical. The you know what is what do we get for what we spend? The ramifications of things. One of the things I will stress is the importance that that we don't practice this as a black box. Is that this you know on the analytic side on both the sewer and the water side it has a hard foundation in material science and the processes of deterioration. And if it doesn't, you're not practicing it right. Uh, but it allows you to leverage a lot of innovative things. We have all of these innovative ways to fix pipes and the way to an analyze that in the context of things are really there in the context of this, these advances we have in computing power, our spatial representation, the automation process. And those are really powerful things that we can do. And uh, I think they will they radically change the way that, that we can work. So AI, as I said, it's just, it is the theory of, of computer systems that perform tasks. You know, it's, it's visual perception, speech recognition, 
decision making. It's ways that we can utilize iterative techniques. In the world of sewer, a, a lot of us are kind of enamored by that picture we see on the right, where the you know it's it's uh, automated defect recognition, and automated defect recognition is a really critical thing in the in both not only the sewer business but in the way that we can advance some of the analytics we use in the water side. But it is one piece of the puzzle; it's not the whole puzzle. Machine learning is is really any algorithmic process we use that that iterates that basically allows us to learn you know to to improve our decision making. And I, I work with a fellow named Jim Davidson, and Jim always gives me a reality check. And this is Jim's textbook from 1981, and it is called The Handbook of Artificial Intelligence. So if you think artificial intelligence is brand new, forget about it. It's been, it's been around for a long time. And the iterative process, you know, is, is in the context of the way we use it now because of their ability to do computing power is, is quite frankly, blows me away from, you know, someone who's been in industry and things that we thought we figured out a long time ago, our ability to solve complex problems is, is very, very powerful in terms of the, these advances we have. But in essence, the core of them are founded on good science and good analytical techniques. And if they weren't, Quite frankly, they'd be as silly as chat GBT given some silly inputs in the in a, in a context of it. So the, the, the primary tools I'll talk about today, and by, they are by no means the way I talk about them, are the only way that they can be used. There are things from my perspective and, and stuff that we've been exposed to, but on the water side, certainly predictive, uh, deterministic tools. Most of us, if we've done advanced work, have built multivariate models before. And uh, that has been put on steroids in the last few years in terms of what we can do. Uh, innovative, you know, rehab and, and uh, assessment techniques. How do we factor those in? How do we, you know, how do we look at the impact of those over time? And I would say the word optimization is somewhat of an oxymoron, but optimization in terms of understanding, you know, how we integrate these things with everyone. There's no one who's run a water main renewal program that doesn't have a paving program thrown at them. There's no one that's, you know, had a good idea that, you know, said, well, this is a good idea, but we got to change, you know, you got to change your decision based on other things. And in that process, I call optimization, but it is understanding sort of what happens when someone throws you a curveball or the, you know, the impact of, of multiple things. On the sewer side, it sure is, is, is built on strong data. And because we have PACP and it meets a high bar is we can do things like automated defect recognition, which will change the way that radically that we can process data, the rate of it, the, you know, the accuracy of it. But beyond that, we have to treat things. Defect cluster analysis, innovative rehab, same things, you know, the different toolbox from the water side. And at the core of it, we want to know what we're going to get for this. And that's what advanced capital planning is. That's driven by iterative techniques, as I said, by, I think, real intelligence. But advanced analytics allow us to do an awful lot in terms of, of progressing these things into the future. On the water side, one of the first things that we do is certainly statistical analysis. Uh, everything fails by design. It doesn't fail by because of a you know an accident. And when you go and look at things, and failure data in the water system tells an immense story in terms of of how much we learn from this. This is the city of Toronto's curves. Everybody has a different set of data, different drivers, but the the vast majority of work. That, that we do in water systems is really in the world of small diameter water systems. If we look at, at the amount of failures that occur, anywhere from 95 to 98% of failures occur in, in water mains that are 12 inches and under in systems. You only have a little bit that fails in big, that's what we drive condition assessment for. But that failure side is, is of immense value. And it fails by era, it fails by exposure, it fails by different things that we can do. Size effects have a huge impact. And a, a typical, you know, area that might have 90%, 98% of its failures on 12 inch and under, it'll have maybe 95% of it on basically on, 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 on four inch, six inch and, and, and eight inch diameter mains in the context of it. And that's an immense data, you know, warehouse to, to give us a, a really, really good overview of, of what this means. And we can build very powerful models with that. The other thing is that is we've watched the evolution of that. We've built multivariate models, and and I, I follow uh, Andy Raven's work a, a lot. And, and Andy has been uh, very very well published in terms of, of different types of multi multivariate models. But the reality is is that we can we can build them on hard science, but we can advance them by machine learning, by advanced iterative techniques to get better fits. 
But the, if it's not built on good science, in fact, Lee, it's, it, it will be a silly model. But the things that we can do from a computational perspective, again, can over, you know, like nothing happens by accident. So taking data sources like the, 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 the corrosivity of soils and overlaying that to, you know, to use that. Uh, we used to, you know, be able to solve kind of one pipe at a time in a system. And in an afternoon now, you can sit and take a good hydraulic model and a digital train model and assign unique loading conditions on, on, a, on every stick in a system and start to ask it what if questions. Uh, we worked on the Colorado Springs in about uh, going back 10 years ago now. And uh, fellow Jim, Jim Davidson basically fit, you know, unique loading conditions to 220, you know, and deterioration conditions to 220,000 sticks. And we can sit there and subtly change our question in four minutes, get a, an answer for the whole system. We worked in Toronto. Uh, it's a bigger system, 2.9 million people in the context of it, eight minutes. So computationally, the, you know, our ability to do that, and that allows us to, you know, to, to understand the impact of other things in terms of a very, very powerful multivariate model of looking at the impact of many things. So we, we, we can build ourselves, you know, an understanding of deterioration. We can have a predictive model. We can have this, what I call applied loads deterioration model. The reality is, is that there's other things that we can't control that actually trigger failure. It's not just deterioration, it's the severity of climate. The, 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 someone gave us cast iron pipe at some point in life and cast iron pipe, even though it deteriorates and it makes it more fragile, what ultimately will trigger failure is often the severity of a winter, uh, the, the, you know, changes in moisture content. And we have to, to understand whether our models are accurate or not. Uh, we have to sit there and fine tune them for actually climatic effects. Now we can't predict climatic effects going forward, but we can certainly understand certainty limits of them. And that's a, a, a common type of, of uh, secondary effect that we need to model if we want to understand predictive models and, and cause and effect of what happens in, in, in water systems. But these two different views of things give us different ways to, you know, the, uh, to understand the system. I like to look at the, you know, the deterministic type of model to understand, you know, in a very, very finite level of detail, a stick by stick behavior of the system. So we look at things in terms of bad areas and I may not get the right stick and I, I, I may be close, I'll be in the right neighborhood, I'll be in the right area, but I get a much more discrete view spatially of where I am. From a practical perspective, when you sit and, and take these predictive models and roll them up, they're very accurate from the system level. And I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that in a second. But it allows us to, you know, to sit there and, and ask questions. The, the little graph you see on the on the right is is across the top of it is 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 basically telling me how to fund and and throwing money at something to, to reach a, a different, you know, level of failures moving forward in terms of trying to reduce failures. This was a, a graph that was produced in in, uh, in Toronto originally to look at at a, an objective they had that they wanted to reach by 2040 in terms of of, of funding and, and funding strategy to, to get there. And and that type of view is is actually a very, very accurate view because the individual sticks, it's you know, is is a is a lot harder thing to predict. But the predictive models, as you roll them up into systems, the error averages out if it's a good predictive model, and they can be incredibly precise. If we didn't have different ways to fix things, life would be boring. So in the context of you know of of, of engineering, we need different ways to things. We we need to things fix things other than just by straight replacement. Structural linings are common and a very valuable thing in the toolbox, not typically with with uh, uh, condition assessment, but but in essence, structural linings to basically, you know, figure a, a, a better mousetrap in working with less construction footprint. One of the things I'm quite passionate about is, is what's called assess and fix. And it is, again, a way to bring uh, uh, the condition assessment process to more precisely predict what the condition is. And the, the little views of you know the advancements we've had in, in in remote field eddy current, not in terms of the change in the technology, but our ability to sit and process that data live in real time, allow you to bring in that to a condition and, and create differently, completely different forms of rehab that you you would never have thought of before. And those are very very powerful forms of analytical techniques that you can bring into the field to to make you smarter and develop a big model. As I said before. You optimize these things and you, you have curves thrown at you. Uh, the, the, the type of algorithms that have been used for years uh, were things like genetic algorithms, Monte Carlo simulations, 
uh, capital planning, the way that we could, again, figure out a way, what's, what's the impact of learning from our past guests at moving forward. The, the, the beauty of, of these type of optimizations is that we don't just look at four or five alternatives. A genetic algorithm will allow you to look at about 100,000 alternatives in about two or three minutes. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations will allow you to do tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands in literally minutes. So what allow you to do that in, in, a, in a practical perspective, and we don't just want to solve a problem. We need to, you know, we, we often ask questions, you know, like what's the, how do I get to so many failures by year, what, you know, whatever, you know, we need a targeted there. Most of us would like smooth funding transitions. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have to spend $20 million one year, one, one million the next and just go up and down. So we have practical constraints. We want, you know, smoothness of service level transitions. We don't want things to get worse before they get better. So we want to develop funding strategies. And we all have risk models. So you want to minimize failures at critical locations. And and, and if you have a paving program, throw it up, you, nobody gets, you know, more excited than, a, you know, a transportation department in terms of watching failure. So you have all these constraints. And that is a form of optimization of to figure out what's the real balance or what it's going to be in terms of optimizing all those things and, and modeling them going forward. The cumulative effect of intelligent treatment is huge because this is Colorado Springs and, and in, in looking at their data, basically they had to fix about 180 miles of pipe over the next 20 year period. And if they used replacement alone, it would cost, you know, kind of that $18 million funding. If they, if they could transition to 75% of it strategically in different areas to structural lining, they could knock that off. And if they could start to use anode retrofits and advanced type of you know, assess and fix techniques, in essence, they could they could likely do almost twice as much work. And that's a very, very powerful thing with, without the ability to model that and integrate all of the other constraints you have, you would never be able to see it just at face value. And that's the power of, of looking at a, you know, of a, of a big system model. And as I said, on the, on the predictive model side, this was, this was Toronto looking at 80,000 failures from 1970. The best you'll do with a predictive model is you're going to get a line that, you know, the reality is in blue and the line is a pretty good predictive model. But if you can correct that for secondary effects, if you can look at the severity of the winter, if you can look at the, some models need both severity of winter, some of them need uh, moisture effects, but you can calibrate them and correct them. And it means that you can see, you can't predict that going forward, but you can tell that your model is accurate. You know, it, it's aptly, it's, it's reflecting what's there. And that's a very powerful thing to do. And in, in predictive models of this nature, a predictive model that doesn't allow you to understand why you're doing it or to audit, you know, is it doing it well, is, is not a predictive model. That's not science, okay? You have to be able to be able to replicate this. Uh, when we did this work originally for, for, for my, my friend Matt Coleman in Toronto, uh, we basically, they wanted to get to 600 failures by, by 2040. And I said, if you keep spending money the way you are, you're going to be there in six years. I got a phone call from Matt in five years. And he basically said, boy, your model's all wet. We got there in five. Okay. But when we go back and revisit that in the context of applying the same rules, we'll see that our model, our predictive model, the essence of what controls failure, the cause and effect side of it needs to be auditable so that we understand why we're predicting things. We will be conjecturing. We can do good predictions into the future, but we need to truth that with time to, you know, to have good predictive models. And that's a, an essence of, of using advanced analytics. The sewer world very, very much, you know, is, has been uh, blown away in the last couple of years. And it's not any different than if you went to get an MRI uh, uh, done now or an X-ray or a CT scan, you'll find out that you they get the results a lot quicker and they're a lot more consistent. In essence, because PACP is, is built on something that's real, that is replicatable in science, uh, we can do an awful lot in terms of, of teaching the camera how to code defects. And that's what automated defects recognition is. It is not the entire picture, but it is a really critical picture of being able to take the defects that we see and relate them into sort of how to fix things and the cost to repair the timing. And that's kind of the big framework that we're trying to do, except now we can do it at a, at a much higher processing speed. We can do it more consistently and we have a greater need than ever to verify it. It doesn't mean human beings don't get involved, but it means that the process can change radically. And if you think about it, this, this PACP 
that we have. And like I said, if it if it didn't match science, you couldn't teach a camera to do it any more than you could teach a human to do it. But it does meet the you know the the bar of replicatability, and we test that out in the context of ADR, and it proves that out. But the two things we know when we get something is that one, we understand the spatial ramifications of defects, and that will tell us how to fix things. But in a bigger picture, if we know something as simple of how it was born and what was kind of the exposure environment, we can also look at the longer term picture, and that's deterioration modeling so that we can understand the impacts of time. And those are two things that we ought to be doing with data the moment we get them in the context of a good sewer program. The, the uh, how you fix them depends on what's wrong. You can really break sewer defects down into loss of ground driven defects, which could be different ways that the ground really impacts failure. The pipes develop cracks and fractures because of how they were designed, sometimes because of a little bit of fabric decay, but mostly because of just cracks and fractures from original uh, construction. Uh, H2S is a unique process, so that there could be biological processes that are going on inside, and that is hard material, a different form of modeling. And if we run an infiltration program, in essence, that is very, very you know, closely related to loss of ground, but we need to look at the impact of grain size, the soils, the hydrogeology of it, and those are all things that we can model. We can model them both in understanding the deterioration process, because we can look at the time effects of these, and then we can look at them in terms of rationalizing, what do I do about this in terms of what type of you know, technology that's out there? And there is a whopping amount of, of innovative rehab. It's not that complicated, but you can look at the, the extent of the defects and the technologies that are out there, and you can apply the right technology to the right problem by developing a, a good guess at it and developing a simple set of rules. The simple set of rules I call defect cluster analysis. Uh, when we first started doing it, it was it was trying to understand the difference between a pipe with almost no defects in it, just a couple of localized fixes versus something, when do I fix the whole manhole to manhole segment? Uh, what can I line? What can I not? And out of the, the, the world of PACP, you can pull that data out and analyze it. Uh, when we first developed defect cluster analysis in terms of algorithms to go and guess the data, it wasn't to, to stop engineers from doing their job, but it was to give them a hint. Uh, we thought that maybe if we could be 50% right, it would at least make them more consistent. What we found in the first day set, you know, data sets that we ran it on is that we were 85 to 95% correct. That's how simple, that's how powerful it was. And it doesn't mean that we didn't do engineering to go and finalize that final adjustment, but it means the moment that you've got data in that's been verified, you have an 85 to 95% understanding of the financial ramifications of what you're looking at. And that's incredibly powerful. And it's incredibly powerful in the, you know, in the in the processes that we use afterwards in terms of applying good, consistent judgment. And it would allow us to assess new technologies and new things over time. If the rules change, what's the ramifications of that in terms of long-term modeling? So in this big picture of sewers, we have this, you know, we have we have the pipe. We have the pipe that's in a current state. We know that fixing it at different times in its deterioration process it costs more the longer we leave it to. We can, you know, we can we can do recommended repairs. If we if we look at things, we will find things that we wish we had fixed five years ago. If we don't look at things, we'll eventually see, you know, start to lose vehicles. We'll see catastrophic, and we can offset all of that by reinspecting at a current frequency. And this is just a big do loop that now we can run, and we can run and understand sort of what's the ramifications of different treatments, what's the ramifications at different timelines, what's the ramifications at different risk levels. Because when you look at this from a practical perspective, as I said, you, you, we know for a fact that when we go and fix things at an early point, we, we, it will cost less to buy a new design life. We also know that we're spending money before it's time. So the deterioration process allows us to, you know, to, to model the financial ramifications of our investment strategy. We know that the, the amount of pipe we leave in the back foot log with severe defects will, will have a, a statistical relationship between the amount of emergency repairs. And if I don't fix an emergency repair, if I don't know about it, I will have what is called a catastrophic repair. This is back when in my hometown when we used to, I was a kid and we used to fund things at 1,000, 1,874 or 76 years you know, per fix. And that was grossly underfunded and, and we didn't have enough inspection and we didn't manage it. We balance those out over time and we don't see that anymore and we, and we can factor our, our analysis into it. 
So in the advanced analytics that we look at, we can now look at them both on the inspection side and spatially map this out into the future. We can run little AVIs of where our programs are likely to go. As I said before, they put us in the right neighborhood, not necessarily on the right stick, but they allow us to adjust it you know, subtly on a, in a, you know, on a short frequency basis every year, two or three years, and they get us literally with real programs on the right sticks. And on the treatment side, similarly, we'll see clusters of areas to know where we're vulnerable based on the constraints we have. And if we have a paving program, if we have other types of areas that we have a, a need to go develop, we can sit there and spatially understand with a great degree of, of accuracy what neighborhood we ought to be in and, and the areas we ought, you know, ought to be in and, and finalize those treatments, not necessarily 40 years in advance, but certainly five years in advance, well in advance of it to, to, you know, to pick the right sticks. And then when you roll this up, you want to know what happens. What are these questions? What do I get for what do I spend? Uh, what happens if I do nothing? And this plots, you're looking at the blue line being emergency repairs, the red line being catastrophic repairs, and then the condition doesn't change that much in a lot of systems. But in essence, I will have a lot of other things going on if I do nothing. This was a strategy developed again, you know, back uh, actually about, about 15 years ago when we first started to collect large amounts of data and rationalized a way to keep the backlog. That was kind of the, the funding, you know, rehab uh, approachment of it. And uh, we're spending our money at 10 million. And it basically, we're, we're, we're doing enough backlog to keep condition there. But in essence, our reinspection program, and if we don't adjust the amount of backlog we're getting in there, in essence, we'll start to have emergency, you know, like catastrophic repairs because we're not learning about things. But it allows you that type of benchmarking view, again, not in hours, not in days, not in months, but in literally very, very quick time periods to ask what if questions and, and do very, very powerful views of the future and developing very defensible type of programs in terms of moving forward. So on the sewer side, you know, the 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 AI and advanced analytics uh, allow us to do long-term condition state forwards. If you didn't have PACP, if you didn't overlay other information, you wouldn't be able to do anything with that. Uh, but they, they allow us to sit there and understand long-term condition state. They allow us to, you know, to, to identify goals and set, you know, transparent goals of that we can go back to, to our, our policymakers and the people who fund us to say, what will we get? What do we get if we don't have this money and, and what will it look like moving forward? It allows us to, you know, to develop coherent strategies to determine how much to inspect, how much to fix, how to fix it, how to meet certain benchmarks in terms of things and then do capital formats, you know, you know geospatially analyze these things. Monte Carlo simulations have been used for a long time. One of the, the beauties of it from a, a practical person is that this bottom one, this is the city of Hamilton looking at, at funding in, in, in the long term is in a, the beauty of a Monte Carlo simulation is that it not only gives you some insight into the future of to where you're going with a certain roadmap that you've painted, but it gives you certainty limits. So in essence, it'll tell you if you're sitting on bad data, if you're sitting on uncertainty, in essence, your, 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 your certainty bounds will be far in excess of the roadmap. So it provides you a good visual understanding of the roadmap that you've painted and where it is. It allows you to look at you know things like the time value of money in this plot and see when things flatten out where basically I'm spending things or I'm fixing them so fast, I'm fixing them at you know less than the money I'm saving in, in terms of that. And those are very powerful things that we could not do without advanced analytics and our ability to look at things in a in a in, in, in these you know critical manners. And the water side, it's just I it's unprecedented, you know, the our ability to understand cause and effect. And, and by understanding what causes failure, that's your vulnerability. And, and this with multivariate models in the, in the context of the way that we analyze things, it's very, very powerful. It will come into the treatment selection. And much like we have ADR, uh, the, the work that's been done on the RFEC side is not the ability to, you know, this will not work in big water mains, but in the world of, of, of basically 12 inch and under, our ability to adjust design on the fly uh, through RFEC inspections is very, very powerful. And, and our ability to do that on the fly is another form of advanced analytics that we can sit there and not only do condition assessment, but very, very quickly, we can understand how to match a, a semi-structural to a structural fix in terms of matching the treatment on the fly to the, you know, to the specific problem we find. And that's very, very powerful form of advanced analytics. 
but it is these key questions. You know, what do we, what do we, what happens if we do nothing? What if we get more? What if we get less? What happens when they throw me a curveball? And and the only thing I would caution is that just because you can get answers doesn't mean that you know an answer. Is that when you look at this, it needs to be an, a, a work trail that is auditable, that is fully auditable. There's a lot of things that we do, and in, in the context of these old books, one of the big risks of artificial intelligence is answers that you can't explain. And and in the context of a good process, if we can't audit it, if we can't sit there and verify our answer, then quite frankly, we haven't done anything in terms of advancing knowledge. We just got a silly answer that might be a silly answer at the end of the day. But we can do this in the context of processes. You just need to give it some thought in terms of putting this all together. And with that, I'm finished. Is there any questions? Hi, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, that was awesome. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, we we do have some questions. Um, I have some questions as well, but we've got some that, we've got one that's come in here from uh, Nimarta Gill from Peel Region. Uh, the question is, what various criteria would you recommend to come up with a pri prioritization list of inspection for transmission and subtransmission mains? If risk is considered as one of the top criteria, then all our transmission systems are critical in terms of LOS, level of service. Any thoughts? Yeah, and it, it's important to be eloquent with your arteria, you know, your arteria, like the... the uh... There is a, there's both a, an AWA manual that was developed a number of years ago to try to monetize failure to help us get some understanding of it. But if you go back to the, the international, you know, the original international rehab manual in terms of building risk models, 101 from New Zealand, is that it tells you to at least provide a system. And you, most of us think that if we have more factors we consider we're smarter. And, uh, and the reality is, is that the more we confuse an issue with data, sometimes it just becomes clutter and noise at the end of the day. So a good risk model is something that you put things in three broad categories of, of something that you can't manage that should never happen because it's in a failure that you do not have the resources to manage. At the other end of the you know, spectrum is stuff that I agree is, is, is rarely in transmission, but you go look at your transmission system and you can in Peel, you will find portions of it that you have enough redundancy that you can manage. You know, it, you, can, you can manage failure in that context. And in between that are things that you know put a strain in resources. So a risk model at the end of the day has to meet that level of transparency. Otherwise, you don't have a risk model. You've just got a whole bunch of things that you threw at a dartboard you know, to, 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 to do that. So certainly size, redundancy, most risk models that we work on look at, you know, the, you know, an economic component, look at a, an operational component in terms of, of how it impacts your ability to be in the business you're in and an environmental component in terms of, you know, what is it, what does it mean in terms of breaking the law and, and often a social component in terms of, you know, of the degree of impact on people. And there's good risk models out there that allow you to do that. And just because, quite frankly, all of the failures in transmission will scare you, you will find <laughs> transmission system being component into three boxes of three boxes you can live with. And if you don't put them in those three boxes, they'll just all look the same and you, you won't get that level of discretization. But you can come up with criteria with that, even for, you know, a system that is a, a critical system. Okay. Um, that was great. I, I don't know, Nimarta, if that um answered your question or if you have any follow-up question to that you can just post it in the chat there um yeah that is tricky because you think of all your transmission mains as being oh we can't yep. afford for this one to break yep um and i and i would think every municipality would um th their systems are all unique so it comes up to the municipality to prioritize what level of risk is important but it's um, put it in, you know, like in finite boxes, you know, in the, in the context of, of things. We worked on a, a model once that had multivariate type of parameters for risk and added a young engineer going into a meeting and they had 55 variables. And I said, that's too many. And uh, 
and he came out of the meeting with 90 variables and all that plots at the end of the day is that, oh, everything, you know, nothing can fail. And that's not true. You know, you, you look at things in terms of redundancy or basic terms. There is a big difference between, you know, the, the, the ones that impact 80 or 90 percent of the system and the ones that have full redundancy in the context of things. So. All right. Awesome. Um, okay. We have another question here um, from Tayab. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, what is PACP data? Ah. There are lots of acronyms, acronyms you threw out there. I'll let, I'll I, let you answer that. I apologize. Uh, the, the language of sewer defects uh, <laughs> is, is, is recorded in a, and it is an acronym and it is pipeline Boy, I'm going to blow the acronym. Uh, uh, I might have to get Chris Mitchell to help me because uh, uh, I've been saying PACP for so long. It is the language that is uh, that is uh, um, licensed by NASCO. Uh, it is a, a language for categorizing sewer defects that evolved out of uh, the sewerage rehabilitation manual in the UK in the 1980s and 1990s. NASCO created uh, the PACP rating system to classify structural and O&M and construction feature style of defects in pipes. And it allows us to have a unique language when we put a camera through there to categorize every feature that is unique about the pipe. Uh, so PACP is, is the language of defects. The, the, uh, the PACP in the context of, of North America uh, evolved out of what was called the the, uh, the WRC manual of, of sewer re rehab. If you followed that, version four of that was version one of of PACP, and PACP next year will be up to version eight in the context of of both the core observations. But it is the language that we would be able to call something a crack, something a fracture, uh, give it orientation in terms of longitudinal circumferential. And, and basically put all of those observations into a database so we don't have to just physically look at it. We, we can do an analysis to understand the spatial impacts of it and the, and the nature of the defects. So hopefully that answers it. Uh, yeah, and I just added in the chat there, it's actually an acronym for Pipeline Assessment Certification Program. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, and, and it's like Chris said, it's like a language, but it's a standardized coding system. And, and in order to... Um, the CCT, you, you need someone who is trained in P, in that coding, who understands that language, because yeah. it's like Chris said, if, if I did it and I don't have my certification, I call it a crack. Well, that's a fracture and that gets a different rating. So it's really important. And I think the industry did a good job of deciding we need to speak the same language when we talk sewer defects. So, um, really super important that, um, we're all speaking that language when it comes to sewer defects. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully that answered the question. Um, okay. Uh, Blaine Hunt. Oh, sorry. Did you want to say something, Chris? Oh, I'm just going to answer that question. That That's a good one. There are there specific spec, uh, steps in the review and reliance of, uh, that are generated by uh, AI. And, and that is a really good question. Uh, just because there is automated defect recognition doesn't mean that you don't audit the process. The, the camera is impacted by the quality of data. Um, one of the things we're trying to do through NASCO is provide guidance in the context of the next year, you will see guidance on, on how to audit that type of data. Uh, because auditing that data is as important as auditing the human beings data. Right now we have verification processes, not just trusting a human being, but by independently reviewing certain portions of the work to make sure that it is accurate. Uh, there is no question automated defect recognition is a quality, it, you know, it's a function of the quality of the video. Video at higher levels of resolution uh, is coded more accurately, both by humans and machines than very poor quality video. That's a reality of it. In the context of a good piece of automated defect recognition software, it will not only give you an answer, it will give you a certainty of observation on that answer. So it allows you to audit in the context of, you know, not only 
not only is this a, a fracture, but it's a fracture with a 90% level of probability, you know, at a very, very high level because of the clarity and the distinctness of the feature. So there are very specific ways to go through. And if you sit there and don't audit ADR data, then in essence, you could be left with not just making a little mistake, you could make a lot of mistakes and you make them many, many of them, you know, so you know, making a million mistakes in a day is not going to make you smarter. But by auditing a portion of that work, and I, I think one of the other things that is that we need to, to to realize is that we don't measure how a machine does something as a human does it. The bar in in uh, in NASCO PACP is to make sure a human is at least eighty five percent accurate on all of the work they do. And for a human, the you know the implication is that a human's always trying to do 100%, but we're not perfect. That there's a certain amount of variability in the system. The bar for a for a camera, you know, that's trained by automated defect recognition has to be higher, because if we if we train it and calibrate it to 85%, it's not going to be 86% correct. Okay, it's in essence it needs a different way of looking at things. And in the context of looking at the accuracy of it we need to set a different way of, you know, of, of evaluating its accuracy because it is as good as what the camera has been traded, trained on. And uh, uh, the, the, the core data that we train ADR on is a big issue globally. In the UK and in the IS, the world of ISO, uh, the, uh, there is very, very much uh, 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 a move towards, obviously, just like we are in North America, doing automated defect recognition at a much higher level. And what there is from the WRC side, and I believe you will see NASCO adopt a similar approach, is, uh, is to create a global, a global database of imagery to train cameras on. And that way, someone's not limited by, you know, the, the quality of their data. But it's not hard to, you know, to develop a program to, to, to assess the reliability of, of automated defect recognition. It's just different in the context of, of we're assessing a machine's ability to be, you know, replicatable versus a human. But it is very, very similar type of processes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's still uh, an important step. Um just on that note, how far off do you think we are, like it, in terms of AI? Really, actually, you know what? Yeah, no, the, the there is a a huge, and again, it relates to the quality of the data. Is as you crank up the resolution on your inspections, uh, an ADR system will be more accurate, and it'll give you it'll be you know because it's it is as, it's just like a human. So if you're trying to use it for legacy data, you will find that in essence, you have a greater degree of variance. The other thing that is subtle is that the, the core, you know, like the root defects are, are easily attainable uh, by multiple pieces of software right now. And uh, as you get down to the modifiers, and I don't want to give my colleagues a hard time, but as you get down into modifiers and modifiers at the bottom of the chain, it's harder and harder to verify those. And I would suggest that it's harder and harder to verify them in both human beings and in machines, because we're starting to, you know, to, to break down away from that thing that is it's the, the process itself is not as replicatable. But for the root defects, uh, it's very strong for a, a number of pieces of software. And again, if you elevate the, the quality of the you know the the quality of the video that you go and capture it has a huge impact on performance of ADR as a technology and we okay. use it right now in a lot of places it is a it has a huge impact on on the, the reducing the cost to do verification and do treatment assignments in condition assessment work okay um, there's a lot of questions that have come in here now, so I'm going to try to keep getting okay. through them. If if you don't think it's answered, put it in the chat and I'll try to get to it. Um, so the next question is from Jax Vollmer from GM Blue Plan. Have you found excessive coding by ADR systems has an impact on modeling reliability? And I'm not sure what's invented by excessive coding, and I, I, I would have to defer to the system you're looking in because... Uh, I proper interpretation of automated defect recognition in the manner that we talked about here uh, does nothing but Im 
improve our ability to be consistent. And uh, so I, I, I would say it, I, I, I can't, I'd have to be shown a specific example of what's called excessive coding, because in, in my experience, we don't see excessive coding, we see coding of what it sees, it codes everything because that's what it's trained to do. And it's as good as what the model is trained to do. So not all software is, is, is equal. And uh, if you can't verify it, then it has a huge impact on modeling reliability. If you can verify it, then in, in essence, all that ADR does is, is improve modeling reliability. Um, okay, I'm just, uh, sorry, I just got a note. We can also, if we don't get through, we can answer questions offline too, but um, I think, uh, let's try to keep going here. Um, this is from Adrian. Sessie, the city of Waterloo. Hi, Adrian. Um, cost of CCTV is high. Would AI slash ADR be much cheaper considering the outcome from AI is not NASCO certified and post-processing is required? So it's a, a tricky question because there's some things in there that are not technically correct. Is that it, certainly NASCO doesn't so certify, you know, the, the piece of software they do certify the data and, and and are actively working on systems to make sure that what you have is in essence a a verified PACP data set at the day using ADR techniques. So the 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 ADR committee is working on on a couple of work streams that you will start to see uh, be reported on at the NASCO's general meeting next year, and you'll see them come out over the course of next year. One of them are guidelines for how to basically audit what's a, a proper way to, to, to validate or verify an ADR data set, which is not going to differ a lot from how we verify a human data set. Because human data sets that aren't verified aren't any better than an ADR data set, you know, that's, that's not verified. So it is very, very important in terms of that process to verify it. The other thing that is quite real is that we've limited, you know, like the the uh, ability to to do a, an inspection right now has been limited literally since we've started doing CCTV to about 30 feet a minute, nine meters a minute, based on our perception of what a human brain can process. EDR is not limited by that, and we know that. And we're trying to quantify that in the context of, of an inspection technique to one, to crank up the resolution to make the RDR, quite frankly, more accurate, and to, to, to basically have the resolution cranked up such that it can be slowed down for human verification. And, the, 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 uh, and that balance is something that we're trying to work through as industry. The net impact will be the ability to reduce the cost of doing CCTV work, because in large programs, we'll be able to inspect much faster than, than 30 feet per minute. But to do that, we need a, a program of verification, and that is really, really critical. Right now, the cost of just the post-processing itself with verification and sticking to 30 feet per minute, we can demonstrate that in, in essence, it saves a lot of money to, to basically run a condition assessment program over a conventional way of doing a condition assessment program. Okay. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, we'll move on um, to Brian Murray from the town of Penetanguishing. Uh, are there software packages out there that are available to complete ADR for sanitary CCTV videos? Yeah. Yes, there are a number of them. I don't want to, I at the risk of getting into trouble because because we market them, uh, other people market them. Uh, it's, it is an emerging field and there is a lot of software out there and I would, you know, like any type of software procurement, I would, in, you know, in, in encourage you to, to go and ask some hard questions and to, and to do some work with it before you, you know, go buy the car. But in the context of it, yes, there are a number of packages out there to allow you to do automated defect recognition and integrate that into a condition assessment process. Okay. Um, Next question, Ashwini from IKT. Yep. Um, AI answers what 
question mark, but it is also coupled with the answers why. I mean, why is a simple crack more critical than a complex and wider cracks? If 100 red zones are indicated, which of them are to be addressed first? So first of all, in a, in a question, why is a simple crack more critical than a complex and wider crack? That's actually false. That's, that's a technically incorrect statement. Cracks and fractures in rigid pipes are, are hinge points. And when it becomes a fracture, the definition of what a fracture is under PACP and WRC is basically a crack that has, has basically progressed to full wall thickness. Now we use visual criteria to identify it, but the significance of a fracture of a basically a crack that is, has propagated to full wall thickness that is rated in terms of severity is it facilitates loss of ground. Loss of ground is why pipes deteriorate over time. One of the most primary reasons that pipes fall down is not the fracture itself, it's that it facilitates the loss of ground process. So if you understand the deterioration process, the, 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 the language itself is and the severity of the defect, which is quoted under PACP, provides you very good insight into understand that with other supplementary information and understand how it relates to the deterioration process and, and the different means you have to fix it. So that's the best I can answer that without going over the one o'clock or the, the two o'clock <laughs> initially. So, but I would suggest come and sit at a seminar where we talk about deterioration in detail. And there is a good reason, you know, and, uh, and uh, that we've been utilizing PACP and WRC coding for a long time. It is a, a very, very good language that helps us understand the physical needs of deterioration and, and rehabilitation. The coding, the coding helps. Absolutely. Distinct yeah. the, the difference between that. Yeah. Yes. Thank everybody who helped me get, I'm going to be beaten up on the technical advisory council. Everybody who pointed out pipeline assessment certification program for me. So. <laughs> it's, okay, you were on the spot. I, you say it so much. I get it too. Uh, yeah. uh, Joanne uh, Barrett from city of Calgary is asking without having read NASCO guidelines, for AI policy, is NASCO providing any specific guidance for companies and utilities to explore automatic defect recognition? The answer is yes. We, we, you will see through the committee, we regularly pump out guidelines. I, I would be, I, I would answer in a supplementary question. I'll have to go look, but I could provide some links through NASCO. That's their objective. Uh, ADR and and the use of advanced analytics will have a profound impact on the sewer condition assessment industry and it is something that we spend a lot of time trying to disseminate good knowledge and good guidelines on how to do it we don't certify software but we certainly license the language of use it and provide guidance on on the you know on the the means to you know to apply it uh, correctly and and yes there is a there is an active committee uh, there's actually a number of active committees from the software side, from the rehab side, all sort of promoting the, the, the use of it and integrating it. And there is there is some good guidance on that to stay, you know, to, 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 to stick tuned. So if it's possible to answer it afterwards, I can get a couple of links and make sure they're posted. Yep, we can add to that for sure. Um, okay, next question, Rebecca from Concordia. How do you decide when a model is good enough? What level of accuracy do you strive for in different types of projects? It's a good question, and and I think it's 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 not one answer. You know, it's it's understanding how accurate your model is and what you can do to improve it over time. Uh, the Toronto example I showed was an extreme one, but I, I know from you know from working on their data on the water side with eighty thousand failures to work with, thought that this would only be applicable to people who had years and years and years of data. We found good fits in terms of understanding the right order of magnitude to invest in the right direction at data sets much smaller than that. Uh, and on, on, you know, the, the, the core of it is if you can understand cause and effect and trends realistically, uh, you, you can produce a, a model that is a lot better than just guessing at. You also, in the going through the process that I talked about, is it helps you understand. That's why I said you have to audit it. It's not as much coming up with an answer, but it's understanding what contributes to that answer. 
because moving forward helps you refine your model and refine you know the way that you're looking at the, the deterioration process and and to, to basically improve the accuracy of it and that's kind of the it's the best answer i can give because it's not it's not one number it's seeing good evidence that you have a good understanding of cause and effect for each pipe material each era you know on the water side and similarly on the sewer side in terms of what contributes to the deterioration process? What's the primary driver? Um, okay, it is two o'clock. I'm not sure if we're allowed to go on. There's still three more questions. Uh, <laughs> um, do we want to keep going on? We can we can do follow up answers to these. Uh, we have them all recorded. Um, I, I have a bit of time, Chris. Or do you want to keep going? I'll go through a couple of ice. There's a couple more in here. The the approximately when do you think AI pipe condition assessment could become a common practice? A lot of my seniors think that it will never be implemented, even be implemented. And and I, I can provide a, a good story on that because when when we sat and presented back to the board on on uh you know uh at at NASCO and, and talked about, you know. Uh, this is a real thing. This is not, you know, a whim. This is not something that's five years off. It's stuff that we're doing right now. So the answer is, if you're not looking at it, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're missing out on, on, you know, on the use of advanced analytics. So it is becoming a more common practice. We find more uses for it in other ways. One of the things that is, is incorporated into PACP8 is a data structure to start to reflect uh, the, the you know the difference between both legacy data or the manner in which your analytical technique was used to uh, to you know to uh, to factor that in in terms of how you assess data reliability. Uh, but as a time frame, I would tell you a lot of places that we work with, and not just me, but uh, a lot of places across North America and globally that use ADR right now, they don't use it. So if, if you do use it and you use it blind without verification, it's as dumb as doing human work without verification, but it is a little bit more challenging and very, very important to focus on that. But it is not something you may never implement it, uh, but but there are many who are, and and the people who do as an industry, industry will benefit a great deal from, from the implementation of it. Okay, um, I think we'll keep going. I still see 86. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Philip Bald from GM Blue Plan asked, when forecasting wastewater defects, what type of machine learning models would you recommend? I've seen some people attempt to forecast PACP defects in research papers, but a lot of them don't have a good understanding of PACP standards and end up with models that are fairly inaccurate as a result. Example, some that forecast purely based on the defect grade instead of grouping relevant defect types together first. I'd yep. be interested in hearing of any modeling techniques that you have come across that have been proven to work. Yeah, and I similarly, I get to do peer review of wild ass modeling techniques on a regular basis, and and I would concur. It's, it's like someone trying to, you know, Factor. I, I would say eloquence has a great deal. Stephen Hawking talked about the importance of eloquence in a model. Uh, one of my best Stephen Hawking quotes was: "Was he? He said he could produce the mathematics that shows you that the that the sun ro revolves around the Earth, but he says it wouldn't be pretty. You know, your watch is going to look pretty funny, and uh, and that's uh, eloquence is is important." Uh, you are correct in that you do need to group these. You need to understand the process that you're trying to model and the way that you would model H2S is radically different than the way you would model loss of ground style of defects. Uh, the most simplest model that we've done on times of loss of ground or infiltration related defects have been just straight Markov uh, modeling techniques, which is a very simplified way of looking at it, but forecasting it out on a stick by stick basis using some other type of techniques to assign the, the randomness that we see of it because there is a randomness to in in reality that occurs to them that i can't take out of it. so eloquent match it to the deterioration process um i can tell you that we've utilized again very very eloquent processes that are simple 
that having looked at them, the, you know, values for investment uh, that we created on a stick by stick basis have a probably a, a, a huge failure rate, but on a, on a dollar value to invest at rated very, very accurate view of the right, you know, the relationship between what we send and, and the rate things get fixed up. So hopefully that helps. And then capacity performance models. Um, that's actually a really good point from Beretta. And, and uh, uh, there is no question that when when we look at things, uh, there isn't, you know, an integration between things and, and, and hydraulics and hydraulic performance in the context of, of risk do have an impact on structural performance, on structural risk. So uh, uh, certainly in the, in the context of the way that we look at things, optimization of solving multiple problems, whether it be hydraulic deficiencies like on the, on the sewer side or on the, on the water side where we're trying to solve more than one problem, that is the beauty of an advanced optimization model is you know look at the impact of many decisions on your you know your path through as opposed to just one because it's wonderful if we're just from the structural department and we're just trying to fix these pipes but we do have hydraulic upgrading we've got all these other problems and if you can't look at the net impact of you know following that through you won't know the best solution overall so it is important to integrate them at the end of the day to to look at that and i'm talking about Optimization of, of models, it's, it's talking about exactly that, is what does it take to solve all our problems, not just the one that we're given in the context of it. Yeah, I, I think I think that's it. I think we got through all of them. Okay. Do you see any more? There's some, yeah. but I think we can take a look at them at the end. That's a pretty good run of them. And if that helped, I'm. That's a, an insight into what we're we talking about in in uh, in Richmond in uh, in March. So, yes, yeah, come, <laughs> or or I think it's going to be in um, Ontario. Ontario, okay. Yeah, wherever I, we're talking. Uh, we're, we will have that posted. Yeah, I think this is like I said, a, a really big topic, and thank you for trying to squish it in the way you did. <laughs> uh, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, there's, uh, I think we still have 66 people, but thank you for the patience and going over time. Um, yeah, I, I think we can, um, I think we can still follow up with those questions, right, Chris? Yep. I think Megan's Absolutely. telling me she still has them. So yeah, that was great. I, I think the questions were great and this is an awesome topic. Looking forward to, uh, seeing more on this. Yeah. Hard to talk about water and sewers together. Too. It is. It was, but, uh, a bit of a we tried to. There's a lot of commonalities, but they are different beasts. There's no question. Yeah, about and I, I think from a bird's eye view, uh, we've scratched the surface. Like I said at the beginning. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank um, you. Yep. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Hope to see you in December. Bye. Thank you.